I'll tell you a little story. This is in my book. So I had this landlord in Montreal. He lived next door to me. He was an ex-Hells Angels biker. He'd spent a lot of time in prison. And his wife had borderline personality disorder, and she committed suicide when I lived there. My wife and I went over there, and we had a spaghetti dinner one night, and we sort of communicated. And I bought a poster from him because he made these wooden posters that had neon on them, and that's how he made a living. He'd kind of trained himself to be a bit of an electronics guy, and so he made these things. And he was trying to quit drinking, and we talked about that. He was a lot older than me. He was like 20 years older than me. I was about 25 at this point. And uh, we got along pretty well. But every now and then, he'd go out and get and drink. And he could really drink, you know, like he was one of these guys who could drink like 60 beer. And you think, well, no one can drink that much, and you're wrong. I studied alcohol for like 10 years. Some of my subjects' fathers drank 40 ounces of vodka a day and had been doing it for 20 years. So you can drink a lot, and he could drink a lot. And what would happen? He was trying to not drink, but he'd go out and go on a binge, and then he'd be gone for like three days. And he'd drink up all his money, and then we'd hear him out in the backyard howling at the moon with this little little ugly dog he had, you know? <laughs> and he'd howl, and the dog would howl, and he'd howl, and the dog would howl. And, and it was rather unsettling and made my wife nervous. But worse, you know, now and then, he'd come to the door at like 3 in the morning, eh? And he'd knock on the door, and he'd be standing there. And he'd ask me if I would like to buy his toaster or his microwave because he needed some money to keep drinking. And, you know, I didn't really want to buy his toaster or his microwave, but when the ex-Hells Angel, all speaking 60-beer-drunk Quebecois biker shows up at your door at 3 in the morning and offers you to sell, offers to sell you his microwave. <laughs> the easiest thing is to say, I really need a microwave. <laughs> so, you know, I bought the microwave and the toaster and <laughs> some other things. So one time he took me out on his 750 Honda and he put me on the back of it. He wanted to show me his lair, I guess, his hangouts. And I got his wife's helmet on, but it didn't fit. It just sit on the top of my head. <laughs> and he said, I got on the bike and he said, if the cops chase us, we're not stopping. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then away we went. And we went to these, like, these bars downtown on Saint Laurent. They were very rough places. And he got into like four fights that night because he was a rough guy, you know, and these kind of punk, guys would come up to him and sort of challenge him and act stupidly around him and he was very skeptical and if you were acting stupidly around him for any length of time he'd just hit you because he felt that that's what you deserved and perhaps he was right you know so so i had a first-hand opportunity to observe him so anyways he sure enough about a week or two after we had this conversation he showed up at the door knock 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 you know I opened the door and there he's standing there you know with his eyes kind of half closed and he was swaying and he had, I don't remember what the appliance was this time, but he wanted to sell it to me. And I said, I'm not, Paul, I can't buy this. I'm not going to buy this because I know you're trying to quit drinking. And if I give you this money, then you're going to go and drink it up. And it's not going to be good for you. And what else did I tell him? I think I told him as well that this whole thing of him coming to my house at like two in the morning was scaring my wife, who he liked, and that it had to stop. And believe me, man, I was thinking about what I was saying. Because he was watching me like a rough guy watches you. And a rough guy watches you like this. He thinks, if you say one thing that indicates contempt, you're going to bloody well pay for it. And so I was finding my words like, you know, I was crossing a swamp and trying to look for the, for the rocks underneath the surface. And I said what I had to say very, very carefully. And he looked at me for about 15 seconds. And that's a long time to be looked at, at 3 in the morning. <laughs> and he left. And he never came back to sell me anything again. And we got along fine. But that's a good illustration of this issue with regards to truth and success in the strange land. Because I was in the strange land when I was talking to my neighbor, my landlord then and I managed to say what was true carefully enough so despite the fact that he was a very violent person and that he was a very intoxicated person and that he had every reason to be suspicious of me and we couldn't communicate very well and I didn't do what he wanted that he took it and he left and there was no problem and life went on just fine after that and so 
we don't want to underestimate the utility of establishing this bounded relationship with the ideal and attempting to live with some nobility in truth while aiming at the highest ideal. There's nothing about that that's anything but strengthening and positive. And it's exactly what you need to set against the catastrophe and uncertainty of life. Treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. You're someone that you are responsible for helping. So what that means is you have to start from the presupposition that despite all your flaws and insufficiencies, that it's worth having you around and that it would be okay if things were better for you. So you need to take care of yourself like you're taking care of someone you care for. So there's a bit of a detachment in that. And then the next thing is, okay, so now look three to five years down the road. Okay, you get to have what you need and want, assuming you're being reasonable mm -hmm. and that you actually want it, which means you're willing to make the sacrifices that would that would make it possible. Well, you need a pathway to it. You know, if, you're, if it's 10 stories up above you, you need a staircase to get there, right? right? And so you have to build the staircase too. Right. And so in the future authoring program, so you're asked, first of all, okay, here's, you get to have what you want and need. That's the proposition, but you have to aim at it. You have to define it and aim at it. So, here, so then the first thing is, okay, uh, if you could put your family together the way you wanted it to be, what mm -hmm. would that look like? And mm -hmm. so that might be your siblings and your parents. But that also might be, you know, your wife or your husband and your kids, assuming that you're at that point in your life. If you could have the family you wanted, what would that look like? Right, okay. Career, same thing. You get to have the career or the job that, that is within your grasp, necessary and, and suitable for, for you if you were mm -hmm. taking care of yourself. How are you going to educate yourself? Because you're not as smart as you should be. There's a lot more things you need to know. So you've got to keep learning and moving mm -hmm. forward. So you need to plan for that. How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically, right? So um, how are you going to avoid the, the, the catastrophic temptations, for example, of drugs and alcohol? Because that pulls a lot of people down. You need a plan for that. You're going to be a social drinker. How much are you going to drink? How much is too much? What about your drug use? Mm. You've got to regulate that so it isn't a pitfall. How are you going to use your time meaningful and productively outside of work? Because you need a plan for that. So you have, you, do, you want, do you want a long-term, stable, intimate relationship? And if you do, then... How would you like that to lay itself out? You've got to have a vision for that because if you don't have a vision, you're not going to aim at it. And if you don't aim at it, then you won't even see the opportunities when they arise. That's the thing that's so cool. I wrote about this in chapter 10, which is be precise in your speech. It's a chapter about the fact that aims structure your perceptions. So for example, once you aim at something, your brain, literally, the perceptual structures in your brain and your visual cortex reorient themselves to calculate a pathway to the aim. And then what they show you in the world is obstacles to that path and, mm -hmm. and open pathways to the path. That's actually how the world reveals itself. Just like, just like when you're driving in a car and you have a map and you, or you aim at a particular place, then all the things that right. are related to that place show up in the world. It's exactly the same thing because you are traveling through time and space, right? And you need a map. And so, so after you answer these seven questions and you're encouraged to do it badly, because a bad plan is better than no plan. It gives you something to improve. Mm -hmm. So even if your aim is vague, and even if it's off target, if you start aiming and you see you're off target, then you can shift and you can make it more precise. Mm -hmm.